So good morning, uh, everybody, uh, to this session on future directions of global health security. Uh, I briefly introduce myself. My name is uh, Hayo Kulmer. I'm a pharmacologist by background, and I'm the current CEO of Charité, uh, the academic medical center here in Berlin. And I guess during the last 15 months, we all got used uh, to the situation that we had hybrid meetings some people being in the room in the room and the others being uh, online. Here's the um, unique situation, at least so far for me, that I'm the only one who's here in the room. The others are all online, and I, I try uh, to guide you through these uh, next uh, 90 minutes. And I'm very happy uh, to have a uh, to have a board of speakers with me who are extremely distinguished. And uh, I would suggest uh, that uh, once you give your first um, uh, your, your first short note, um, then I would introduce you and give uh, the, the audience a background uh, on your, on your uh, CVs. So why overall should we deal with um, uh, security and in particular with global health security? Uh, I think uh, we all went through the last 15 months with different um, experiences. However, the security issue has really come back uh, to our uh, focus in a very intense manner. And uh, there are discussions now uh, underway whether we would not have to explore broader concepts of uh, health security uh, in a multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary way. And um, we're about to identify new interfaces between traditional security challenges uh, and global health threats. And uh, we try to explore these interfaces in new ways. And um, uh, some countries have created even new agencies. Um, we at Charité think about uh, putting an academic label to the uh, health security. And um, I, I think that within these security frameworks of preparedness and re response, we've seen new forms of cooperation uh, emerging also, to, uh, also between, and this is of particular importance, uh, high in income and low uh, and middle income countries and within regions, uh, at least in Germany, we've learned that even in one country, there are major differences uh, in terms of uh, regions and we need approaches of health security. And uh, once we establish uh, this as an academic discipline, uh, then we, we will again have to build an interface between the academic work and the decision made, uh, makers. And this can also gain really new uh, dimensions. And this uh, standing, uh, this panel, uh, with outstanding contributions, um, uh, we'll try and aim for providing a direction for lessons to be implemented uh, uh, at the national, at the regional, and at the global uh, level. And um, I would like to start uh, with uh, um, uh, Carla Moretti from Argentine. Uh, she was so kind uh, to jump in on a brief notice for her ministry. Carla Moretti is the director uh, of international relations in the Argentine Ministry of Health. And uh, we would really like to start this thing with an international uh, kind of agenda and start. And uh, I guess everybody's interested what the concept of health security is in Argentina. Um, has it changed during the last 15 months? Do you adapt it? Uh, are there new agencies uh, created in your uh, country? Uh, what are the interaction with other countries in your regions and uh, beyond? So what is the, what is the approach cho chosen by Argentina? Carla, please. Thank you, Chad, for your words and greetings to all my colleagues the panel. For Argentina, the public health security is a strategic priority on the national agenda, which is supported by the broad regulatory framework that completes in the implementations of the IHE capacity. Argentina has a national system for competency risk management created by law with the aim of integrating action and articulate the operation of national, provincial, and municipal government, non-governmental non organization, and civil society in order to strengthen and optimize measures aimed at risk reduction and mitigating crisis management and recovery. In different multilateral forums, such as global health, uh, agenda, the G20 and who and others, we reaffirm our country commitment to developing and maintaining the IRT core capacities and ensure it's fully integrated in the health system. 
Our approach is reflected not only through monitoring compliance of the IHA, but also when we decide to perform the GEE in 2019. Regarding the COVID response, Argentina drew on the experience of the swine flu and avian flu, and together with the advice of scientific association and expert in the field of communicable disease, we developed the COVID-19 preparedness and response plan. Thanks to the regulatory framework that enables the president to take action in the events of health emergency, and also because the swine flu experience it was not necessary for Argentina to create an ad hoc structures to contain and respond to the pandemic. Argentina president passed a decree which provides a new measure to be adopted in order to contain the spread of COVID-19. Among others, the decree established the General Coordination Unit of Comprehensive Plan to prevent the public health events of national concert. Argentina developed this intersectoral uni unit coordinated by the Chief of Ministerial Staff and composed of relevant areas from the Ministry of Health and other bodies in order to design and implement a comprehensive strategy to respond to the pandemic and boost economic reactivation. These intersectoral measures made, made it possible to create and strengthen the health system response capacity, including by increasing intensive care beds for adults by 50% and raising the budget of the Ministry of Health. The national production of critical supplies was strengthened together with the Ministry of Productive Development, doubling the manufacturing capacity of medical ventilator and converting part of the textile industry to produce personal protective equipment. The COVID pandemic has shown the intersectoral independence between health, social, social protection, and the economy, calling for high-tech political leadership and national and international investment to support structural and transformative action that build resilience with the society and health system, ensuring the preparedness to face external threats while guaranteeing universal access to health and universal coverage to its populations. In this regard, we are convinced that the approach chosen by Argentina was the right one. However, we were aware that there are room for improvement. One of the greater lessons learned from the pandemic has the need to strengthen our national capacities and to reduce the regional dependence on extra strategy supplies. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it, it uh, sounds like an interesting approach. And uh, I think one of the major things um, uh, following the pandemic will be exchanging the experience uh, we all did. Uh, I, I would have two short uh, follow-up questions. Something that really interests me as somebody responsible for a hospital which is still fighting COVID. How's the current COVID situation in Argentina? Uh, that was one. And the other thing I'm really interested in is, uh, do we have a common understanding of the health security with the neighboring countries? Do we have uh, um, a, a, a situation which goes beyond your country and uh, you interact closely with the others? Yes, regarding this, the last question, I am convinced that there's no, no common understanding on the concept of health security in the region. But at the same time, I'm convinced that no country denies the leading of the role of WHO and the potential of the IHR. Um, in, a world more, in a world where more than the 80 of the doses were administered in the high and middle countries' incomes and were only 2.2 percent of the population in the low countries has received a dose and less one or one percent is full of vaccinated ensuring equitable access to medicine and vaccines it's one of the most relevant commitments in the national and global security agenda especially in latin america in latin america there's an agreement on certain priorities the need of step up and research and develop of vaccines and other health technologies platform that facilitate collaboration technology transfer and equitable distribution, and in this, in this regard, local production, and also play the key role. This is, this is the issue that needs to be addressed by government for us, but also in both local and invest in international vaccine manufacturers, international health organizations, especially the civil society. 
Argentina supports multilateral initiatives such the, the Accelerator Act 8, the Costa Rica Call for Solidarity Action, the COVID, the CTAP, and the COVAX facility. And also Argentina was, was selected together with Brazil to participate in the PAHO initiative technology transfer to production of the IMR vaccines in the Americas in order to produce the MRS vaccine for our regions. We also support the initiative of India and South Africa with the World Travel Organization so that all countries can release page patents and suspend intellectual property medicine vaccine for diagnostic tests and other technology. For us, the world is growing great in balance and inequity when we work, look at the coverage achieved by COVID-19 national vaccination campaign, the rapid emergence of new variants and of the virus, while we are still facing serious threats, especially for unprotected population that are in vulnerable conditions, has been a major and critical problem for our region. We know that the economics of Latin America and the Caribbean will be fully back will finally re, uh, reactivate once the spread of COVID its control. For that reason, for us, ensuring equitable access to medicine and vaccines should be today the, the most relevant commitment in the national and global health security agenda. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm, I, I was particularly impressed uh, um, by your first answer and uh, the raise of the ICU beds. That, that has been a, a major challenge to everybody. And, uh, uh, in in this uh, in this field, I would like uh, to move on to uh, Carrie Byington. She's from the University of California Health, and give her a quick overview. She's the executive vice president for uh, the University of California's Health Enterprise. She's a professor of pediatrics at uh, UCSF, and she uh, um, um, uh, Carrie leads the country's largest public academic health system. So this is really uh, Im impressive, and we've been together in, in a couple of sessions uh, on um, uh, um, health security. And um, uh, so it's a, a really large enterprise uh, she's running with about 100,000 healthcare workers and uh, a total of 10 uh, campuses. And of course, uh, there was a huge challenge uh, in uh, COVID. And uh, as I said, she was trained as a, 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 a pediatrician. Uh, specialized in infectious diseases. Uh, she's a member of the National Academy uh, of uh, Medicine and has served as chair of uh, American Academy of Pediatrics and many other things. So she's an extremely interesting uh, um, uh, expert to talk about uh, security, I guess, uh, both in California and on the global uh, level. And uh, Carrie, there are many uh, people now um, arguing to think differently about health security. Um, and uh, if, you, if you look at the entire translational spectrum from research to application, um, is there a translational approach to health security? And um, maybe we start with, because I know you have a very uh, wide approach to that, what you and your function understand by health security. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kramer, and it is such an honor to be with this group uh, this morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the University of California and uh, some of the things that we have learned as we faced COVID. So for us, um, as an infectious disease physician, I have recognized my entire life, uh, professional life, the connection that we share between um, people, uh, regions, countries, and, and globally. And that understanding now, I think, is widely recognized uh, throughout um, the world, and particularly um, in, in our area in California, as we have worked together um, to combat the pandemic. And there is a great understanding, and I think new uh, respect for public health, uh, particularly within the state of California. Um, I think you had asked that I talk a bit about translational uh, research. And I do think that translational research is something um, that can be applied to um, pandemic response and to health security. 
Um, I'll start briefly by just defining um, the goal of translational research, which is to move or translate scientific discoveries more quickly and efficiently into practices and policies that benefit human health. And for me, I have been a translational researcher even before I knew the definition of, of translational research. But for me, the facets that are really important include uh, collaboration, both uh, multidisciplinary and interprofessional collaboration, and importantly, community engagement throughout the research cycle so that the communities that are involved in the research and that are affected by the research have a voice in what's occurring um, in their locations. In the United States, the National Institutes of Health has categorized translational research with a um, number system from T0 to T4, T stands for translation. And T0 is the earliest form of research or basic laboratory research. And T1 and T2 are different phases of clinical trials, earlier and later clinical trials. And together, the T0 to T2 space translates basic research into human clinical studies. The T3 and T4 space involves translating data into clinical practice and also into uh, populations uh, and taking um, scientific evidence into populations for a benefit of the entire society. And in the past, the translation across this spectrum has been very difficult and has taken sometimes decades or it may never have occurred at all. And so to address these gaps, in 2006, the National Institute of Health began to support clinical and translational science centers within academic health centers. And there are about 50 of these in the United States that have been working you know, for many years. And I believe that these were a unique strength as we faced the pandemic. At the University of California, we have five of these centers located across the state of California. And we have further coordinated and integrated them um, into one system that we call the University of California BRAID. And UC BRAID uh, cares for about 1.8 million hospitalized patients each year and eight and a half million outpatients. And this was such an important resource to the state of California. Um, when I looked at the landscape of translational research in the United States, the CTSA sites really have allowed us to advance, especially the T0 to T2 space and we were able to see many examples of this during the pandemic. We saw um, the availability of antiviral drug and vaccine candidates, which represented years of investment in T0 research. And we were able to very quickly move these candidates into full-scale clinical trials um, using the infrastructure that the CTSAs had built across the United States. For example, at the University of California system, within one day, we were able to stand up institutional and federal approval for the trial of remdesivir and to have all of our um, hospitals, uh, all 12 hospitals across our system um, participating in the remdesivir trials. We were able to do this also with all of the vaccine candidates and we saw the availability of these CTSA sites across the United States um, stand up and enroll clinical trials, sometimes fully enroll them within days so that we could um, rapidly uh, analyze the data and have that data uh, available. And so today, as audacious as it seems, I believe that in the face of a future pandemic, the goal of producing a vaccine within 100 days is actually possible. And that the infrastructure for clinical trials exists 
that would be able to rapidly conduct testing and move those vaccines um, and therapeutics uh, into the clinical space. Where I see much more of a struggle during the pandemic has been in the later phases of translational research, the T3 and T4 space, um, where COVID has really demonstrated a greater need for investment in the applied sciences, implementation science, health services research, regulatory science that would allow us to rapidly move um, successful candidates into clinical settings and into populations. We've also really seen that there should be a greater investment in social and behavioral sciences that would help us better communicate public health messaging and support uh, behavioral change. One of the hardest things to watch in the United States, a country with so much abundance and abundance of vaccine has been the vaccine hesitancy that has resulted in almost half of our population refusing to take a vaccine that is life-saving. So I think translational research does have um, a very important role to play and um, that we can learn from this pandemic and further invest um, in the later phases of the translational research spectrum. Well, thank you. This is uh, really impressive what you've done in, in California. I would have a very short follow-up question. Um, were you able to combine these uh, translational structure uh, with your uh, public health structures in California? Because at some point in time, it will be very important to really translate the ideas you have into the populations. Because, I mean, uh, the things you, you said with reluctance to uh, a vaccination, this is a problem all over the world. It's not to that degree, but similar in our country. And Therefore, I think it will be very important to uh, combine these excellent translational facilities to the public health structures. Does that work or do you work on that? Absolutely. And um, I know you have a question prepared for me for the next cycle where I will talk about that a little bit more. But um, from the very beginning, uh, the University of California is a publicly funded uh, institution and we are the only public health system in the state of California. So from the very beginning, I made the resources of our academic health center uh, freely available to the state. And we have used many of our basic resources as well as our translational research resources to support the needs uh, of the state. And of course, we have also used our clinical uh, resources, uh, our hospitals, our hospital facilities, uh, the creation of new beds has been discussed in, in Argentina. We also increased our beds by about 1500 uh, intensive care unit beds um, to serve the state. So, so yes, uh, we have a very close working relationship with the Minister of Health, the governor and uh, our academic uh, resources. Well, thank you. Um, the next uh, in this excellent uh, panel uh, would be uh, Professor Wolfgang uh, Ischinger from the Munich Security Conference Foundation uh, in Germany. Um, I think all over Germany, he was already famous as Germany's ambassador in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and then afterwards in uh, London. Um, he represented uh, the, um, uh, the EU in uh, various negotiations and, um, and now uh, he um, uh, is really known to everybody uh, by the chairman of the Munich Security Conference uh, Foundation. Uh, and uh, it's pretty obvious that this organization has uh, um, uh, a strong interest in health security and there's an overlapping interest. So I think the MSC has really been one of the early supporters of the concept of health security. Um, you have uh, really engaged during the uh, pandemic in providing um, um, an analysis uh, where you uh, talked about a polypandemic. And uh, the question is whether this approach, your approach to the uh, pandemic uh, should also extend to health security, Professor Schinger. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, 
And thank you very much for having me among these brilliant panelists. First thing I need to say, and thank you, uh, Professor Cuomo, for, for giving me uh, this opportunity to, to, to speak about the kind of work that we've been trying to do and we will continue to be doing. Uh, but let me uh, offer a word of caution first. Uh, I'm sitting here among, um, you know, brilliant scientists and doctors, uh, specialists on virology. Uh, so um, I'm, of course, not a health specialist. I come from the world of diplomacy and foreign policy and, and, and interna international security. So the first question is, what's my business in interfering <laughs> with the work uh, that the real specialists are doing. And here's my answer. Let me make two very quick points. First, the concept of security, um, as it has been, you know, delivered to us from the past, used to be centered essentially um, after World War II um, on question of military security, number of tanks, airplanes, nuclear weapons, etc. Um, and that used to be uh, the agenda of um, the organization that I've now been uh, privileged to, to organize, to chair for the last uh, decade or more, the Munich Security Conference. We began to understand years ago that security um, needs to be defined far more broadly. We started by beginning to understand that Climate security has to be part of a comprehensive concept of security. Then we started to understand that energy security has got to be part of a geostrategic approach uh, to regional and global security. And more recently, of course, uh, cybersecurity, hacking, um, etc., cetera, um, um, advanced technology issues, artificial intelligence, has also entered the spectrum of issues affecting our personal, national, and international security. And the most recent uh, addition to this growing spectrum of international security has been health. I am very proud that because one of my smart young advisors brought the issue up, we, were, we, we entered the stage quite early. I invited in 2017 uh, Bill Gates to speak to the assembled international security specialists. And my concern was that they would, when they heard that the issue is, is, is uh, the, the risk of a future pandemic, that they would walk out and go and, and have a cup of coffee. But fortunately, most of them stayed and listened to what um, uh, rather provocatively at the time, Bill Gates had to offer in terms of a dire warning that the world was not sufficiently prepared for what was eventually going to come and how right he was, I need not explain to this, um, to the panel or, 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 or to this audience. So since 2017, we have made it a point to have fighting the pandemic, uh, to have global security, global health security issues on our agenda. And I promise, it's easy for me to promise that uh, because it's in everybody's interest, uh, that we will continue uh, to have it on the agenda. Most recently, just uh, I think 10 days ago or so, uh, I hosted a small gathering with health specialists in Berlin um, with Bill Gates as a, as a speaker once again. And just a few weeks earlier, we had Dr. Tedros, the Director General of WHO, uh, for a similar uh, smaller uh, forum. So that's the, just the background of our engagement in this field. And the second point is, which I wanted, wanted to make simply to explain what we're trying to do. I think our role as an international informal platform, independent of any government, independent of any international institution sponsored by private and public sources 
uh, from all over the world, essentially. Um, our role has been defined, or I would like to define our role as that of an interpreter, trying to help political leaders, leaders in parliaments, leaders in governments, most of them are not uh, trained in uh, fighting epidemics. Most of, them, most of them know nothing about it. Uh, to help them understand that these issues need to be on their agenda. As we say in German, they need to understand that these issues need to be Chefsache, need to be you know, a matter for the CEO to consider, not to delegate to some, uh, uh, to some lower echelon. Uh, this role of interpreter, um, of, of translating the relevance of uh, pandemic, of global health arrangements, of strengthening WHO, for example, as, a, as the international institution that we have, I'm absolutely against ideas uh, replacing or adding new institutions, I think it is a good idea to uh, strengthen and reinforce and to build up existing institutions. And I think WHO truly deserves and needs to be strengthened. So that's also a part of our job to make sure that political leaders, when they discuss their budgets, et cetera, understand that it's not only about military budget, it's not only about social security at home, it's also important to spend money internationally to make sure the pandemic uh, is fought um, across the board globally. Thank you very much, Professor Bergman. This is just sort of by way of introducing why I'm here. Oh yeah, it's extremely interesting because uh, what you're arguing for is uh, is uh, kind of a, uh, that was the start of your talking, the, the interface uh, between the traditional um, um, security approach, mainly to military, and now to health and other things. And uh, uh, might be worthwhile to discuss whether you would need not new organizations, but a new type of education to some people who are at the end of the day able to understand both sides uh, in, a, in, a, in a similar way. It might be worthwhile uh, to, think about, uh, to think about that. And we can do that uh, for the line of this the discussion. Uh, so the next uh, would be um, Chantal Friebertshäuser. She's from uh, Merkshop and Dome. She's the senior vice president and the managing director uh, there uh, for Germany. Uh, she's uh, on the board of the German American Chamber of uh, Commerce. And um, um, she uh, started with uh, Merkshop and Dome in uh, 2007, had various management functions. And as I said, now she's the senior vice president uh, in in uh, our country, and um, uh, the question to her would be that one concept that has been intensely promoted as a new approach uh, to health security is the One Health issue, which was particularly emphasized by this uh, pandemia. Uh, and we understand a very close relationship between uh, human and animal health and the environment. And uh, your company is uh, active in um, uh, addressing both animal and human health. So is this one health issue and health security uh, an issue for your, con uh, for your, for your company? Th thank you, Professor Krömer, for the kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity to share MSD's perspectives as a, as a biopharmaceutical company with 130 years of history um, in developing solutions against threats in animal health as well as in human health, we firmly support a One Health approach to global health security. And One Health recognizes the interconnection between the health of people, animals, plants, and their shared environment. And this interconnection has increased our vulnerability to new health ch uh, challenges for several reasons. Um, increasing a growing population, increasing contacts between humans and wild or domestic animals, more travel, climate change, we, heard, we just heard about that. And 60% of human infections are of zoonotic origins. And some key challenges that really necessitate a One Health approach include the spread of zoonotic and vector-borne diseases, a growing antimicrobial resistance, 
but also protecting a safe and sustainable food supply. And if we are not able to address that in a one health approach, that will be big threats to our world's health security. And let me mention four critical elements that are, that are important as regards to incorporating one health in a health security approach. And the first one is innovation, innovation for preparedness. A vibrant ecosystem that enables research and development and innovation in new vaccines, antibiotics, and other therapeutics, as well as in new technologies and platform is what enables us to quickly apply or pivot our science to meet new threats, ideally in a very, in a very fast way. And the unprecedented speed with which we saw the development of COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics did not happen overnight, but is a result of decades of research and development and innovation that could be pivoted in a very quick manner to COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutic. The so second element is surveillance and detection. And, that, and when I say surveillance and detection, I mean one health. So it's human health and animal health. Surveillance information is that what provides us with early warning of new emerging pathogens and variants, but it's also an ability to track and understand transmission dynamics, epidemiology, and support the development of vaccine and antibiotics or other therapeutics, but also enable to monitor their effectiveness real life. And we are far away from doing so. The so third element I would like to mention is resilience and response. If we have, and we heard about that a little bit earlier as well, with the different, uh, the different things we need to learn, a robust and resilient public health and healthcare system are essential if we want to prevent, to respond, as well as to recover from outbreaks and pandemics. And already we are seeing that health systems have collapsed from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's something we should learn from. Not only they have been overwhelmed in caring for those infected or hospitalized, but we have also seen a significant drop in provision of routine health services, including preventive services, just like vaccinations, but also cancer screening, for instance. So for example, since the pandemic began, routine vaccination has been delayed or suspended in at least 68 countries, negatively impacting about 18 million children under the age of one and increasing the risk of outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases. There's been a fourfold increase of polio cases in polio endemic countries last year. And we don't even fully understand the full impact of the pandemic on adolescent and adult vaccination rates, just to name these two. So we have to invest in resilience system that can adapt and respond effectively to health threats. And as a company that develops both human and animal vaccines, we see one of the biggest challenges facing vaccination is the lack of investment in the systems, in infrastructure, in maybe prevention culture. I think we, we heard about that brilliantly from Carrie Bryington earlier. And if we if we are not investing enough in systems infrastructure and prevention understanding, then we will not be able to deliver, for instance, existing vaccines to prevent diseases among both humans and animals. And so the infrastructure and systems, and by the way, the infrastructure and systems that are used for delivering vaccination, they also provide the necessary foundation for pandemic response. So that's something to build upon uh, overall. And the last point I would like to mention is there is no one organization or no one sector alone that can address this issue. So we need to motivate multi-sectoral collaboration and it doesn't happen enough. And if we think one health, it's even bigger. And we need to bring together experts across human health, animal health, environmental sciences and other sectors and areas of expertise. I would like to end saying we have a huge opportunity to make pragmatic changes and investments now to enable an end-to-end -end system with a One Health approach and avoid becoming complacent. Well, thank you a lot, in particular for this um, um, 
positive and uh, and uh, outlook and I, I think it was a um, it was a perfect uh, transformation uh, to um, uh, the next speaker in this uh, round because everybody who was in charge during this pandemia learned uh, that the consequences go way beyond uh, medicine and move into the uh, in, into um, many parts of our societies and uh, therefore I'm I'm really uh, pleased uh, to um, announce the next uh, person which is Inga Ashing from the uh, Save the Children International um, um, uh, group. Uh, she's a CEO there from United Kingdom. And um, she's a, uh, an absolutely respected child rights uh, activist and uh, has been associated with Save the Children now for more than 25 uh, years, um, going through the ranks in this uh, organization. And, uh, she was before Director General at the Swedish Agency Against Segregation, uh, which is the Swedish government agency. And <clears throat> this is what I really like very much about this panel that we're able uh, to shed light on um, really uh, a broad range of issues um, uh, dealing with the health security. And the question uh, to Inga would be that uh, health, secur can, health security can mean many things. Uh, you deal now daily with children who have, in essence, no such security. And um, do you sometimes feel that the present discussion, maybe also today's discussion, uh, misses uh, the need of the most vulnerable, in this case, children? Thank you for the question, and it's great to have the opportunity to be part of this panel, and, and thank you, my co-panelists, for your very interesting interventions. But to answer the question, yes, I often feel that the discussion on health security misses out on the needs of the most vulnerable, uh, and, and uh, of course, in, in my role, the group that I'm particularly uh, focused on is, is the needs of children. And I will use the effects of COVID-19 on children to illustrate my point. Uh, and while all countries have been hit hard by the pandemic, the scale of the impact and the country's ability to respond to and mitigate the impact has been unequal. And many countries continue to face the impossible dilemma of having to prioritize COVID-19 and its treatment over other deadly diseases uh, with health resources and health workers diverted to respond to the pandemic. And as we heard, uh, the speaker just before me, uh, Chantal, talk about uh, is, is what it means and has meant for millions of children. Last year, millions of children missed out on basic routine immunization against polio, meningitis and measles. And, and, and yes, one of the biggest challenges is the lack of structure, infrastructure, systems uh, and, and uh, a focus on prevention because uh, the, the lack of, of proper supply chains, uh, shortage of medicine, vaccinations and other com commodities is a real challenge. Uh, food and economic insecurity further threatens children's access to good nutrition and malnutrition rates are expected to rise. It, has, it is estimated that an additional 9.3 million children will be wasted by 2022 with two thirds of these children in South Asia. And this will especially hit girls and in com combination with the economic impacts of the pandemic, it is likely to further entrench gender inequality. The pandemic is also endangering uh, children's rights to education. And while COVID-19 already disrupted schooling for more than 90% of the world learners, uh, the recent report Build Forward Better, or say the children report, reveals that the education of hundreds of millions of children in a quarter of the world's countries is now at an extreme or high risk of collapsing. And as an organization, Save the Children is the world's leading independent organization for children. We are responding to the pandemic worldwide through an integrated program and advocacy response. And we are adapting our work to ensure that we can do our part in making sure that children and their communities, as many as possible, have access to reproductive, maternal and newborn and child health care and nutrition services, as well as to learning safety and well-being and also to advocate for strengthening uh, uh, services to, to support their financial resilience. Uh, COVID-19 is, is, is one example. Another example is, is climate and climate change that, that we are seeing uh, and discussing a lot. Uh, and now also leading up to COP, that, that is a discussion that there's a lot of focus on. But when you discuss climate change, you often forget to, to really acknowledge what a child rights crisis it is. 
And we know that uh, children everywhere will be impacted by the climate change. Uh, they will be uh, bearing the consequences of something that did, they didn't uh, shape or, or, or create. But we also know that the children most impacted by inequality and discrimination will continue to bear the brunt of worsening climate change. So, so just to conclude and, and, and share um, some of our thinking and my thinking on what we need to ensure uh, uh, to, to make sure that we are leaving no one behind uh, in health security. And, and it is that it is important for governments, multilaterals, institutions, international financial institutions and others to, to focus on, on four things, I would say. Uh, and the first is to prioritize the pandemic response alongside critical longer term health and nutrition, education and protection and social protection services. As you heard speakers before me saying, yes, of course, we need to respond to, to, to the immediate crisis, but we also need to invest in long term sustainable solutions. Um, we also need to look, secondly, we need to look at different financing approaches to ensure that social services for children become permanent. Uh, and that means long-term political priorities across the world. And we know, and we have a lot of research and data behind this, that investments of children in children are shown to have a high return on public investments with, for example, up to a $60 in return per $1 invested in routine humanization programs. The third thing is to support initiatives to, to suspend debt service payments for low and middle income countries and work with national governments to ensure that the money freed up from death savings in, is converted into investment in children. We heard from our Argentina about the, the, the challenge with equitable uh, access to vaccines. And, and we have a lot of countries in the world where the vaccination rates are really, really low and where children and the communities will suffer uh, tremendously from this uh, pandemic unless we help them to, to create a sustainable and long-term financial situation in their countries to be able to invest in health. The fourth thing is, is, is to provide safe and legally mandated space for civil society organizations and communities, including children to engage in public decision-making and be part of the conversation. Over and over again, children tell me that they want to be heard, they want to be included. And, and we also heard that the, the need and the call for multi-sectoral sectoral collaboration. It is time to listen. Thank you. Well, thank you a lot for that, because it um, really strongly confirmed the idea of um, health security as an, an overall resilience system. And with kids, uh, we've, we've seen the, the consequences uh, of COVID uh, moving to things which, which at first sight seem to be far away. For example, uh, in Berlin, we had uh, during the lockdown uh, time, uh, an increase in violence against children. Uh, and, and all these things have not been in the initial focus because we really thought about fighting the pandemia from a medical point of view and the entire social issues have been uh, initially so far away. And I, I think uh, making a system resilient against the next pandemia uh, needs a really large overview. And with that, uh, I would uh, come back to uh, Carla Moretti and you in, uh, impressively uh, argued about this um, uh, vaccination issue, which again uh, goes in the direction of uh, international interaction. And uh, uh, you um, answered that already in, uh, in a way that uh, Argentina uh, interacts closely. And I, I would have this follow-up question regarding your interactions with um, uh, WHO or uh, the, uh, the interaction with G G20. Uh, what would be your suggestions to these organizations in terms of redefining their roles? What would you expect for them in the aftermath, if we have a real aftermath of this pandemic? Thank you. Um, I'm think I'm not sure. I think that all the all, 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 all government or all the society and all these kind of organizations have to try to ensure all the population the access to vaccines. I think that it's oh, today it's the main priority for all of us. And all the things that uh, they can do, it's well, well received. Um, I think that uh, nothing could be more important to us is to end the uh, 
the pandemic and recover our economies, our societies, and move on. That's all my that's all I can say. Thank you. Do you have an um, um, Carrie impressively talked about a uh, uh, rather high fraction of population in the United States, uh, which simply doesn't want to be vaccinated. Is that a an issue, a problem uh, in, in Argentina? Sorry, I it's it's not my connection, it's not well. So. What okay, sorry, I can repeat it, uh, but um, yes, um, the, the, the issue was, uh, uh, Kerry was impressively talking about the amount of uh, um, uh, citizens of the United States, which simply refuse to be vaccinated. They just don't want it. And uh, we have, uh, to a smaller degree, a uh, similar problem and an intense discussion in the Federal Republic of Germany. And I wondered whether that's, that's an issue in uh, Argentina or whether the uh, whether the uh, amount of vaccination is so restricted that this simply is not an issue in your country? Uh, yes, for, we have a lot of problems, but thankfully not, not that one. Uh, for Argentina, the vaccination trust is not a problem. The people are very welcome to the vaccine, the vaccine program or the vaccines in general. So thankfully, yes, it's not a problem for Argentina. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, Kerry, uh, the United States are particularly strong in these after action reviews. And I guess you're in the middle of that learning from the last pandemia. And um, something we always admire about the uh, US that they really uh, make these things. And uh, where would you see then universities and medical centers um, in the next pandemia based on a new approach to health security? Um, you have any advices uh, how other countries uh, should organize themselves? Uh, because I, I guess in, in some issues, really, uh, many people look to the United States and in particular to your system in California. Thank you very much for that question. And, you know, we're all learning and we have to all learn uh, from one another. And there have been instances where um, I'm sorry to say we have uh, failed in the United States. We are working very hard um, to understand uh, how we could have responded better. And one of the questions that I am asked frequently and, and one of the uh, areas that I advocate for is a broader inclusion of academic health centers within the health security framework of our state and of our country. And um, to, to link academic health centers more closely to public health. And so when I look at academic health centers, we have an abundance of capacities, expertise and resources and have a very important role to play in health security as we think about the future. I have had the opportunity to work with the Association of Academic Health Centers uh, both nationally in the United States and internationally. And we stood up about six months ago, a presidential council on health security, uh, which I've had the privilege of chairing. And we have defined health security as a state of optimal readiness for response to and recovery from public health threats that endanger health status of individuals and populations. You've heard others use those words as well, readiness, response, and recovery. And we have suggested a framework of readiness, response, and recovery that can create a virtuous cycle in which academic health centers can support resilience of the, patient, of the populations which we serve. You've heard that word a lot today too, and I think it's something that we really need to be working towards. There are a number of examples that I would cite uh, from the University of California. Um, and there are so many ways that academic health centers can be involved um, locally, regionally, nationally, and even internationally. But I'm gonna focus just on three areas. And one has been touched on before, the, uh, um, the idea that the pandemic response <clears throat> must complement um, 
our everyday uh, preparedness and care for acute and chronic disease. And so one of the things that academic health centers must do is work to alleviate health disparities and to support population readiness. If your population is healthier, they will be able to withstand an event um, better than when we see the terrible disparities that the, that the pandemic has disclosed. In the United States, academic health centers, especially those that receive public funding, <clears throat> such as the University of California health, health System, are committed to caring for all people in a setting where universal health care is not guaranteed. I think that that's something really important for those of you from other countries. Our academic health centers form a safety net for the population in the United States, uh, a population that does not have a guarantee to healthcare. We partner with many community advocates and organization, organizations to provide care uh, for special populations and to work to improve their outcomes. Some examples um, for our system include working with high risk or hard to reach populations, such as the unhoused or homeless, in individuals, those that are incarcerated, and those with public health insurance or no health insurance. We build trusted relationships through community engagement with these organizations every day of our lives. And that's part of the work that we do day in and day out. And those trusted relationships and engagements were really important as we responded to the pandemic and helped us reach groups that might otherwise have been left out of the response. So that's one area where academic health centers are really important. The second is to look at our academic resources, which include the expertise of our faculty. Sometimes some of the most knowledgeable individuals in the country are located within academic health centers. Mm -hmm. We also have a phenomenal research infrastructure with equipment, reagents, skilled technicians, um, that can bolster the public health response. When the news broke of a novel virus in China, uh, the University of California leapt into action. We knew that California would be one of the first states affected in the US and, and that turned out to be true. Um, and we immediately began to re redirect our human capacity and resources to uh, support the California public health infrastructure. We offered and provided experts that populated and led most of the committees set up by the governor uh, to uh, coordinate our state response, um, including what would be our response with testing, critical care capacity, clinical research, um, and, and population um, support. And then we also performed designated public health functions for the state. We provided all of the diagnostic testing uh, for the public health departments in the state of California uh, through the University of California system. We trained over 20,000 contact tracers uh, using our education resources and deploying them throughout the state. And then we were one of the leaders of the vaccination efforts coordinating the vaccination efforts in the regions where we had our health centers and setting up large um, facilities for mass vaccination. Our, our system has performed um, almost 3 million vaccines um, at this point, the first million in about uh, one month. And then finally, in the recovery phase, academic health centers contribute every day uh, by doing, engaging in research and creating innovations that can be brought to bear on informing uh, policies, uh, contributing data, contributing new methods for research, and being able to educate um, the population, uh, both uh, in general community education, but also in the new professions that will spring up uh, in response to the pandemic. What are the new types of health professionals that we need? And what are the new types of professionals that can communicate 
across sectors uh, to ensure that uh, we have health security. Some of the things that we're doing in California now are, for example, um, creating a statewide virtual care network that includes uh, virtual critical care for our rural and uh, for our rural regions. We've also set up a new partnership with the state for viral genomic surveillance so that we can identify new pathogens and new variants of COVID as they come into our state. And we're, we've set up a infectious disease and health economic modeling center that allows us to forecast uh, the impact of the pandemic and, and to prepare um, and to develop our policies. So I would say um, that my advice is that we use the resources of academic health centers as an important uh, infrastructure, coordinate them um, in our regions, coordinate them in our countries, and coordinate them nationally to share this expertise. One of the things that has been so impressive to me in the pandemic is the new level of communication across countries, um, on social media, and at forums like this, and the willingness to share uh, best practices and informations, information. And I think academic health centers can really be foundational in that uh, in those efforts. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, really um, uh, impressive because you argued both in the structure uh, and of uh, uh, content. In, uh, in Germany, the federal government has also set up the network of all academic uh, medical centers in our country, uh, gave uh, um, uh, quite amount of money, a couple of hundred million euros uh, to set up this network. And we have the same experience that in joining forces and uh, joining the, the different um, uh, expertise in these academic medical centers really helped uh, fighting the disease, and in particular, it um, may help fight the next disease uh, better. Uh, I would now move again to uh, Professor Ischinger. There's one question that always, um, um, it's way beyond my expertise, but uh, as I have the opportunity to talk to you here, I was always interested whether there was an international instance where the pandemia really affected military readiness. At one point uh, in time, we've seen this American, uh, I think it was an uh, American carrier or something like that, which had a major outbreak, which made the news. But otherwise, it, it was not really in the, in the at least not in my, in my part of what I read as press, uh, that uh, you had a real effectance of military readiness by this pandemia. That's a question aside, and um, I'd be just interested about your knowledge on that. And in general, I'm really interested how the, the MSC uh, moves on to discuss uh, health security because you have such an important, uh, 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 such an important conference. And uh, the question there would be um, whether the traditional security challenges uh, and the global health threats uh, um, can have an overlap, uh, which should be discussed at these type of conferences. Your mic is off. Is it okay now? Can yeah, you hear me? That's fine. We can All hear right. you. All right. Well, thank you very much for what I think is a really uh, key question um, as seen from our sort of global political and international uh, vantage point. Um, let me start by saying that we have uh, started to argue already during the beginning of the pandemic that this pandemic is not a one issue uh, problem of uh, people suffering from, uh, from, this, uh, uh, from this illness, but that it is actually something which we chose to call a poly pandemic. In fact, the Munich Security Conference released a report late uh, last year uh, under this exact title. I, I wanna show it to uh, the participants it's called polypandemic, um, and it deals with the following phenomenon. We believe that the direct, but more importantly, in this case, the indirect secondary effects of the COVID-19 pandemic reverse progress made in conflict resolution, 
made in development, made in uh, societal resilience, and in other areas. Let me give you just a couple of the brief examples. First, second, one secondary effect of, uh, of our pandemic is a hunger pandemic. According to the World Food Program, the number of people facing acute food insecurity was projected was projected to double due to COVID-19 to up to 265 million people. That is uh, relevant. Uh, second, uh, a kind of a inequality pandemic. You know. Uh, in Western countries, in among OECD member countries, we have an average of about 30 or so, 29 to 30 physicians per 10,000 inhabitants. Uh, in the least, development, uh, least developed countries, uh, you don't have 30 physicians per 10,000, you have maybe two or three. So the obvious result of that is that uh, the um, pandemic has created a, a huge problem in the uh, among less developed countries. Third, um, a poverty pandemic. According to World Bank figures, a hundred million additional people will end up or are ending up in extreme poverty in in 2021 uh, due to COVID-19. And, um, and just to complete the picture. Uh, we see a violence pandemic and an authoritarianism pandemic. According to the International Rescue Committee, 20,000 people were killed worldwide in military conflicts, even after the UN Security Council called for a global ceasefire because of the pandemic. 20, 21,000 uh, innocent people. Um, and with regard to authoritarianism, uh, the, the figures indicate that the increase in government repression between mid-March and the end of July 2020 was an increase worldwide of about 30%. In other words, we have a problem. So just to conclude, what might be uh, recommendations, suggestions for the country that where I live, for Germany, for the European Union, but more, but more generally speaking, I think for for the international community. First, uh, we need to adopt a holistic response to the COVID nineteen poly pandemic. Uh, this includes not only talking about but actually meeting the the 0.7 uh, percent goal of official development assistance to the underdeveloped uh, countries. It, it, it requires a more meaningful uh, role for the European Union among the 27 EU member countries in issues of global health. Uh, we need a, an EU health strategy, which did not exist really so far. Uh, we need third, uh, to reinforce transatlantic cooperation. Sadly, as a, you know, as a former ambassador to the United States, I have to say that uh, cooperation on the pandemic and how to deal with it has been, uh, let me say it diplomatically, less than satisfactory during the pandemic. Just think of the uh, travel bans for Europeans, uh, think of export controls, I think of the lack of U.S. support for the pandemic treaty that we are currently trying to draft, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a there is a lot of room for improvement uh, uh, across uh, the Atlantic community. And finally, uh, strengthening WHO has to be a major political um, goal for the European Union but beyond for the international community as a whole, um, we need to make sure that going forward, the WHO uh, can rely on, uh, you know, uh, more on, on uh, certain uh, benefits from government uh, than in the, in the past. In the past, they have re relied a lot on, you know, occasional donations, uh, 
by institutions, by governments, but there was never a clearly established uh, uh, significant budget. And, and finally, uh, making COVAX work has to be also a major goal of the international community. So as my own country takes over the uh, chairmanship in the G7 uh, next year, early next year, uh, this will be a, a very important part of our responsibility to make sure that global health issues will figure as a major agenda item um, uh, on this issue. In my view, uh, as a foreign policy person, the um, issues pertaining to global health, the issues pertaining to fighting the pandemic and its consequences is not a sprint activity, it's a marathon activity. It will require the long haul, it will require to repeat and repeat and, and insist and remind uh, political leaders uh, what needs to be done. It will not happen overnight, but that's part of our role to remind them. And that is why I'm, I'm absolutely determined to make sure that when we meet in the large gathering, which we have each February in Munich, and I'm now quite confident that despite rising uh, COVID-19 numbers again uh, in, in Europe and in Germany, I'm quite confident that we can have a physical, not only a virtual, but a physical event in Munich, maybe with a more limited number of, of senior political leaders from around the world. Uh, but we will have uh, this issue that we're dealing with here today uh, on, on the agenda. And we, we, we will remind political leaders of their responsibility. Thank you, Professor Bernie. Well, there, there was a, a strong commitment uh, from the uh, political side we, before we heard a uh, similar strong commitment from academia. So I, I think it's um, it's uh, straightforward to move to uh, Chantal Friebertshäuser with the question, what this new concept of health security means uh, for and results in for the private uh, sector. And uh, I guess in particular in pharmaceutical companies, uh, you're on one hand uh, very close to solutions of the problems by providing vaccines and drugs. Uh, on the other hand, we heard a lot about social consequences, which at, at the end of the day uh, is a responsibility of everybody. So um, what's your issue on this new concept of health security from the view of the private sector? Yeah, thank you, Professor Krömer. You talked earlier about joining forces, and we just heard as well about holistic and multi-sectoral approach. And of course, it doesn't go again, uh, without a strong private sector, which is just part of the development of a sustainable end-to-end -end system. Um, and the industry in particular, the, the biopharmaceutical industry is bringing critical experience and expertise to the table in our case, uh, in the development of Ebola vaccines, uh, but also bringing these Ebola vaccines to the places where it was needed or measles or COVID-19. And we are ready and willing to continue to strengthen health security. But it also relies on a healthy life science and biopharmaceutical sector. I think it was very clear we heard that. But even with the incredible records that we've seen with the development of COVID-19 vaccine, which was the fastest development we had seen after the development of the Ebola vaccine, by the way, we have to say that vaccines and medicines don't just appear on demand. And in a way, we were lucky. Uh, that we were able to develop so quickly such vaccines. And it was the acceleration of the development was only possible because there was investments in infrastructure, there was expect, expertise already in place and that across industry sectors who were able and motivated to partner right away to develop those. So decades of investment had been done in genetic sequencing, in data sharing platforms, in vaccines technologies, but also strong intellectual property protections. Otherwise, there would not have been, for instance, 20 years of research in mRNA technology before. Um, so the, 
the ability to rally these forces and to capture on what had been done, I think, was crucial. But also, and I must say that that was very unique and something to learn from, the ability of companies and governments to come together, partner, and mobilize significant investment at risk that led to these unprecedented achievements in research and development, but also in manufacturing capacity expansion is something to learn from. So I think we have to learn from that. And while it has been unprecedented and in a way heroic to see such great investments and some great uh, achievements, we have also have to recognize that it has been patchworked and often pulled together just in time. It was in emergency mode. So we have a real opportunity to create and invest now in a sustainable pandemic plans, in policies and system that will allow us to meet the ambition calls for action that we heard from leaders around the world to, for instance, develop effective and safe pandemic products within 100 days of a new pandemic declaration. We heard that before. It is possible, but it will not happen every time we see a new a new virus emerging, we have to do something up front to make that happen. And secondly, to ensure equitable access to those products for people worldwide. And we all have a role to play, we as a private sector as well. And I think both of these ambitious goals will require political leadership, political will, global coordination, regulatory alignment, public-private partnerships, and solidarity. Um, for upfront and ongoing financing for a worldwide efforts. So I think a couple of, of recommendations, uh, what, we, what we learn from COVID-19, but also our work on Ebola or other epidemics events before. First is the environment, we need a strong environment for innovation and research and development in order to meet this 100 days mission. And we heard already about regulatory bodies, right? For instance, it's more collaboration and coordination across regulatory authorities to reduce complexity, but to accelerate decision making when we need it. Uh, it's early and ongoing research and development on specific pathogens of epidemic and pandemic potential. And the normal market forces do not apply in these cases. So it requires different kinds of push and pull incentives, including continued robust intellectual pro uh, property protection. And second, we heard about resiliency um, but we also need resiliency in efficient manufacturing and procurement capacity, obviously. Again, in, in the cases of epidemics and pandemics, the normal system do not work. So we need different kind of, of, well, of systems to support um, supply planning and to offset risks like different ways of financing uh, but particularly financing and technical assistance for countries with limited or no capacity to finance their own pandemic activities. Um, but obviously, relevant private and public sector stakeholders need to come together to develop a holistic strategic vision for a flexible and sustainable global manufacturing capacity. Every country building their own capacity to be safe and closing their border will not help us in pandemic preparedness. We need exactly the contrary. We need a global strategy for pandemic preparedness in manufacturing. I think we heard that with the Argentinian example before. Uh, that was not what we've seen, and we, we saw poor collaboration at some, at some, in some cases. And last but not least, and I mentioned that before, that the reason why I, I will do it very shortly, uh, we need to improve global surveillance and health system planning and delivery, because that's the only way we can be very fast in understanding where do we need to pivot the science and the research that we have together with academia in order to make sure we have within 100 days a response that we need and we track real life if that's having the effect that we want to have. So surveillance, but also health systems planning and delivery will be extremely critical. And 
and the biopharmaceutical industry continues to play its role uh, in the current pandemic. We have, we have still a lot to do, but is also committed to working with, with partners across all, across all sectors to make sure we improve future pandemic preparedness. Well, thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, the um, um, uh, last question in the second round uh, goes uh, to Inga uh, Ashing uh, with, the, with the queue whether a concept of health security would be changed or would have to be adapted if you specifically could uh, put women and children at the center of health security. Uh, what would change in the in the in this issue from your side of view? Thank you. Uh, happy to, to respond to that, but I, I just want first just want to start by highlighting some of the messages uh, delivered by my fellow panelists. So, so I do think, regardless of of, of uh, th there is a need to, to further uh, focus on, on women and children, but but I do think that, that the big things that we need to do is to make sure that we have holistic. Uh, responses, uh, holistic strategy, global strategies, uh, strong partnerships uh, to be uh, prepared for the next uh, pandemic and, and also invest in global health systems. So, so I just want to re reinforce what, what my colleagues on, on the panel said. But, but to be a bit more specific on, on the point on, on women and children, uh, and, and as we all know, when as many of us said in the first round, I mean, COVID-19 disrupted uh, basic service delivery at all levels. Uh, and uh, if I just focus on, on uh, women and girls, uh, what we saw is that in addition to education protection and general health services, uh, women and girls faced disruptions to sexual and reproductive health information and services, including contraceptive, safe delivery, and, and both pre and postnatal care. And, and we estimate that the economic impacts of COVID-19 alone could lead to an additional 1 million adolescent pregnancies in one year. And recent analysis from UNICEF further suggests that an additional 10 million girls may be married by 2030 as a result of the pandemic. So women and girls need to be prioritized in any concept of global health security. And I think we all know <laughs> that uh, one of the, 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 the biggest challenges to adolescent girls is uh, early marriage and her early uh, child um, uh, pregnancies. Uh, and, and that is the, the, the main killer in, in many countries when it comes to that particular age group. And, and I was visiting Western Central Africa just two weeks ago in, 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 in Burkina Faso. Half of, of, of the girls are married before the age of, of um, 18. In Nigeria, it's 76%. So, so and this is worsened by COVID-19. Uh, and we, we do have a, 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 a crucial opportunity to ensure that all countries come out of the crisis with stronger and more resi resilient health and nutrition systems, and, and that we really focus on creating a more equitable global health architecture to guarantee better health and nutrition outcomes for generations to come. And yes, of course, we need to draw on the lessons that we have learned from the pandemic on how to respond, prevent and prepare, prepare for future health crisis. Uh, and, and using uh, all, all, all the examples that have been named in this panel. But just a few uh, things that, that I, I think will be important for us collectively to do. Uh, and that is, firstly, when we discuss concepts of global health security, that we put people first, especially those most impacted by inequality and discrimination, such as children and women. And, and secondly, uh, uh, building on existing multilateral systems and organizations to drive global efforts for pandemic preparedness and response, rather than uh, duplicating them or creating new parallel systems, because that will take away focus on, on the basic uh, needs and, and make, make sure that we can focus on the right things. And, and thirdly, we need to use the political momentum to ensure long-term and sustainable health and nutrition financing and to support strong and resilient public health systems. And, and I do think that we, I've, I've been in many, many uh, conversations, as I'm sure all of you have, where we are constantly saying, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And I think this time we really understand it. So it is the time to come together. Uh, and, and a couple of things, uh, and I think it was mentioned by Professor Ischinger as well, 
we need to meet long-standing aid commitments by spending at least 0.7% of G GDP on ODA with at least 1.0.1, I mean, percent uh, for health, because we need to have a very specific spending on health in order for, for us to be prepared for the future. Uh, and, and free up space. I talked to, about this as well to, to look at health, uh, debt service payments and free up money to invest in children. But also to see how, how we can make sure that people have a real access to, to health services and, and uh, look at user fees, at least for the most vulnerable populations, uh, to make sure that they actually have access to health care. And finally, uh, make sure that essential routine services, which are critical for child and maternal survival, including maternal and newborn and child health, sexual and reproductive health, Im immunization and nutrition, are maintained and strengthened during this COVID-19 uh, outbreak and beyond. Thank you. Well, thank you a lot for this um, impressive summary of, of uh, that part of the problem. Uh, we have now four minutes left, and I would uh, take a view to the audience whether there are specific questions from, from, from the audience. I have another tool here to see that there are no uh, questions from the net. So if there are no further questions, I would like to end uh, this um, round of discussions by really thoroughly thanking all the participants. Um, it has been a, a really interesting round with a high variety. I've, I've really experienced such a variety of expertise in uh, one uh, panel coming from different directions, contributing many things and really emphasizing uh, the importance of interactions uh, to solve this uh, problem. And I, I guess uh, if we close the session three minutes early, uh, uh, nobody's angry about that. If uh, Professor Byington is really in California, it should be one o'clock in the night there or 1.30. Uh, so I guess everybody appreci appreciates um, a little early finish. And thank you again for being with us here at the World Health Summit and uh, hope to see you again in similar rounds of discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.